Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, our 14th of 2022. My name is Pamela Howitt, and I'm the Senior Technical Advisor here at the Aproctor Group. If you've missed any of our series, which has been running for over two years now, you can view them all on demand right here on YouTube or on our learning hub at www.proctorgroup.com. You can also now register for our online members area where you can access product information libraries, personalised CPD certification and our free online U-value and condensation risk calculator. As always, you can also request product samples, arrange follow-up meetings to discuss the specifics of your project or book one of our expanding range of REBA assessed CPDs covering a range of topics. This can all be done either face-to-face -face with our team of experts across the UK or online. Today, we're continuing our products and practice series of case studies with a look at St Sidwell's Point Leisure Centre in Exeter, designed by Space and Place Architects alongside Passive House designers Gale and Snowden and delivered on site by main contractor Keir. St Sidwell's Point is the world's first Passive House certified multi-zoned leisure centre. This 6,700 square metre, 44 million pound project is a state of the art showcase for forward thinking sustainability focused design and uses a wrap tight vapour permeable air barrier as part of the highly efficient external wall construction. So today we'll look at the performance of this unique project alongside the systems and technology used to achieve these results. We'll also discuss the challenges involved in the on-site processes and how they were overcome through training and upskilling. We'll finish with our regular Q&A session where we'll be joined by special guests Keir Construction and architects Galen Snowden to answer your questions and discuss the project in more detail. Planning of the development at St Sidwell's Point began in 2011, with this site being the centrepiece of a wider regeneration project across central Exeter. This wider regeneration includes residential, retail and office developments and aims to enhance the city centre both economically and in terms of health and well-being. Through their existing house building programme, Exeter City Council have over a decade of experience working with passive house projects. So, when planning to replace the city's 50-year-old pyramid swimming pool, the council was confident the passive principles could be applied to deliver not just a substantial carbon emission reduction, but also a healthier and safer environment. Developed on a brownfield site, the new centre comprises a 25 metre main pool and 20 metre learner pool, a confidence water pool and a 100 seat spectator area. There's also a variety of dry site facilities including a cafe, soft play area, gym and health suites and a spa. As well as being the world's first Passive House certified multi-zoned leisure centre, St Sidwell's Point is also designed and constructed to the Building Biology IBN Best Practice in Health Building Design and is resilient against predicted climate change to 2080. Leisure facilities, and particularly swimming pools, are usually the most energy intensive buildings in a local authority's stock, so reducing consumption can have a major impact on an authority's energy footprint. According to SIBSI, a typical leisure centre will consume 1,573 kilowatt hours per metre squared per year, of which 237 kilowatt hours is electricity for lighting and services, while 1,336 kilowatt hours is used for space heating. In contrast, the target energy use for St Sidwell's Point is just 375 kilowatt hours per square metre per year a 76% reduction over a typical design and almost half the energy use of even recent best practice. At the same time, it provides a 50% saving in water use and the pool's water contains less chlorine than tap water. In combination with state-of-the-art ventilation, extensive use of natural materials provides a significantly healthier environment for the 500,000 visitors anticipated annually. As leisure centres are large complex structures with many different internal environmental conditions to accommodate, carefully managing these multiple zones was a key part of the energy performance strategy. While the pool areas require a substantial amount of space heating, the dry side areas such as dance studios and gym facilities often require cooling. 
The building is therefore laid out with the pool areas on the glazed south and west sides of the building to maximise the free passive heating from solar gain. These areas are also separated from the rest of the building with well-sealed doors. The gym and studio areas are on the north and east sides where solar gain is reduced. The heat loading produced by activities and equipment in these areas is removed by heat pumps with the recovered heat used to raise the temperature of the pool water and other areas of the building. Intermediate environments, such as administrative areas, are located in the centre, creating a thermal buffer between these heating and cooling zones. Several plant rooms of varying sizes are distributed around the building rather than centralised to minimise the length of duct runs needed and hence the associated efficiency losses. Each thermal zone has an individual air handling unit and opportunities for natural ventilation are provided for summer comfort. The use of highly efficient air and water source heat pumps means waste heat can supply the majority of the building's space heating requirements. The environmental conditions of the pool areas are also optimised to minimise evaporative heat losses from the water. The pool halls are heated to 31 degrees and kept at 64% relative humidity and the two smaller pools are also drained overnight. This reduced evaporation also reduces the required ventilation rates as less dry air must be supplied. These efficient and precisely controlled internal environments make the performance of the building fabric extremely critical to delivering a good result. The foundation of passive house design is ensuring a robust fabric first approach to efficiency and this is no different here, just scaled up. The five main principles of passive house design are thermal insulation, thermal bridge free design, air tightness, ventilation with heat recovery and high performance glazing. We saw earlier how the ventilation and glazing systems play a key role in maximising space heating efficiency through using solar gains and waste heat effectively. Let's now look more at the build-up used in the facade systems. The main considerations here are high levels of thermal insulation with thermal bridging reduced as far as possible and low levels of unplanned air movement through the fabric. There are three main types of wall structure employed at St Sidwell's Point, with some sections being a steel frame construction, others block work and lastly cross laminated timber. What the three types of construction have in common is that the insulation and air barrier layers are fitted externally to the main structure. The insulation across all three wall types comprised of 250 millimetres of mineral fibre insulation with a thermal conductivity of 0.034 watts per metre Kelvin. Because this thick layer of insulation is placed outside the structure, thermal bridging is easier to manage than if the insulation is placed between structural elements. The effect of the overall heat loss of these thermal bridges was extensively modelled and these results fed into the overall energy model. While most domestic scale projects can simply use standard details to minimise the effect of this bridging, larger projects can benefit from a more finely tuned approach that this extensive modelling can facilitate. This modelling and optimisation also extended to the fixings used and how and where they penetrate the insulation layers. Cladding brackets are thermally isolated to minimise their effect on the U value, which across the various wall areas varies between 0.1 and 0.148 watts per metre squared Kelvin. The external location of the insulation also makes it relatively easy to wrap around the entire building, around junctions between walls, roof areas and floors. This approach also extends to the air barrier. Our wrap-tight, self-adhered membrane is used as the air barrier across all the facade build-ups and, like the insulation, is placed external to the main structure. The build-up is completed by the fire shield vapour permeable membrane on the outside of the insulation. This outer membrane protects the insulation from the effects of wind washing and is secured using an adhesive stick pin system to minimise additional penetrations through the air barrier and are also of limited cross-section to minimise thermal bridging. We'll discuss the installation process in greater detail later, but in this location, it's far simpler to install the air barrier to a high standard as there is less sealing and jointing work needed around services and other penetrations. This air barrier allowed the air leakage for the building to exceed the certification requirement, achieving 0.3 meters cubed per square meter per hour at 50 pascals against a target of 0.4. 
The final air test result of 0.3 meters cubed per square meter per hour at 50 pascals equates to an equivalent leakage area of 770 square centimeters, or just over one and a quarter sheets of A4 paper. Each stage of the program reflected the focus in achieving the standard. The program delivery required a full understanding of the sequencing, specification and detail of the build. The air tightness strategy and testing regime was built into this with specific time allowances made for this within the program. The insulation joints, taping, spraying, sealing, parge coats and setting up of air tests, which typically would be a non-critical pathway, had to be included throughout and thought about and planned. There were also specific hold points set, for example, testing of rooms or floors as a shell and again once completed. The early engagement with subcontractors and collaborative approach was key to understanding the sequence, logic and methodology involved and ensuring the best performance was achieved with minimum remediation. Maximising the thermal performance and reducing the air leakage also makes the management of moisture more critical, particularly when dealing with a warm, humid environment like a swimming pool. The warm frame configuration used here, with the insulation external to the structure, is inherently less prone to moisture issues, but it's still important to ensure the system performs as expected. In this case, the use of wrap tight over the sheathing with insulation externally meant that there was a vapour permeable membrane in the location where a vapour control layer would typically be installed. To verify the performance of this build-up, our team undertook a detailed hydrothermal analysis of the construction. The first step in this process is to conduct a U-value calculation to BS EN ISO 6946 and an associated condensation risk calculation to BS EN ISO 13788. This process determines the temperature gradient and dew point throughout the structure and delivers a good overview of the performance. We have a bespoke calculation system developed in-house to undertake these assessments, which is available to registered users on our website. The software uses postcode specific climate data and can produce fully compliant PDF reports for submission to building control. You can also collaborate with your team across multiple SAVE projects and send calculations for review by our team of experts. In the case of St Sidwell's Point, there was a desire to go into more detail about the performance of the facade system. Our team therefore undertook the more advanced BSEN 15026 dynamic moisture assessment we've discussed in our webinars before. This assessment gives hour-to-hour -hour results instead of a simple monthly figure and gives more detail in the temperature, relative humidity and water content across the facade assembly. The internal environmental data can also be more closely aligned with the highly optimised pool hall design than is the case with a more simplified method. These graphs show the hydrothermal characteristics through the SFS facade with the external side on the left. The graphs on the right have a conventional vapour control layer over the sheathing, while on the left hand side this is replaced with the vapour permeable wrap tight. While there is a minor variation in moisture buildup between these two constructions, this is not of sufficient magnitude to cause concern. We can further use this model to look at the moisture content at various points within the fibrous insulation itself. We can see here that while there is a high relative humidity at the outer surface at some point of the year, the average is significantly below the 70% threshold at which condensation risks would be expected. Humidity within the insulation layer itself is also substantially below this. Again, there is very little difference in performance between wrap tight and an impermeable VCL. Finally, we can assess the water content of the layers, which shows that the hydroscopic sheathing board stores the vast majority of any moisture accumulations. This means the performance of the insulation will not be reduced by excessive moisture uptake. We can see from both the 15026 and the 13788 calculations that this construction performs well hydrothermally with or without a conventional vapour control layer. In practice, a vapour control layer, our Profile 861, was used in the pool hall areas. We've discussed how the on-paper performance works, but if the products and systems are not correctly installed on site, these ambitious performance targets will not be met. Delivering Passive House requires collaboration at every stage to be successful, and this was recognised early on by the delivery team.
any part of the wider team could negatively affect the air test result or energy performance when working to such a tight standard. Therefore, the quality culture had to be set and consistently disseminated throughout the client, design and construction teams and throughout the supply chain. Collaboration and quality control were significant factors considered during procurement. Over 2,500 people worked on the project post-contract. One of the first challenges was to ensure a full understanding of Passive House, and Keir introduced the Passive House Passport. The passport is awarded for the successful completion of Passive House induction and training. All operatives take part in the induction, and the training is specific for each trade. The supply chain involvement included 71 different trades and it was clear it wouldn't be workable to have site managers checking every detail. So the idea of the Passive House Passport is to empower the trades and gain buy-in to the principals. The modules were developed with consultants warm and then rolled out across the wider team. Some trades, for example groundworks, M&E and facade, are integral to achieving the air tightness rating, which is essential for Passive House certification. So their training was very detailed and complex around minimising thermal bridging, for example. Developing a quality culture and pride in the work undertaken was a critical element and a key part of this collaborative approach was establishing a no-blame culture. It was essential from the start that if a mistake was made, that people felt comfortable to raise it so it could be rectified or a solution found. These risks were further mitigated by undertaking extensive training using mock-up panels to test significant details and work through interaction of different suppliers, as well as testing alternative build-ups, sometimes introducing risk mitigation measures such as secondary air permeability barriers in key locations. Client designers, contractors and supply chain have worked closely throughout to deliver a successful outcome. As part of this training, we delivered a Raptite toolbox talk on site and conducted practical training using the mock-up panels to demonstrate the best installation process for Raptite. The project team at St Sidwell's have exceeded all expectations and delivered a building with almost no performance gap to the highest standard of design. The strength and collaboration with the client and wider project team and the commitment throughout the journey have always inspired the trust of everyone involved and the confidence that the project would be nothing other than a success. Finally, the legacy for the local community includes the engagement throughout the build, delivering 925 hours of employment skills support and 34 T-level placements over 45 weeks, inspiring young people to join a forward-thinking, sustainable industry. St Sidwell's Point represents the future of sustainable construction in both technology and working practices. The project will benefit not just visitors who will enjoy the unique quality swimming experience, but also everyone involved in the project delivery by illustrating what can be achieved. And on that note, we'll now move on to discuss the project in more detail in our Q&A session. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kira Proctor, and I'm the Managing Director here at the A Proctor Group. I'd like to welcome you to our 61st webinar, believe it or not. Uh, we've been doing these for quite a while since the start of lockdown, and we now have well in excess of 100,000 views. Uh, so we're very proud of that. And what a fantastic topic we've had today. So I've really enjoyed that, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about what all the panel here have to say about it. Um, I hope you're all doing well and uh, thank you Gail again for attending. So as you know we will stay as long as we need to, to to answer all your questions so please ask them here on YouTube, email us at webinar at proctorgroup.com or you can DM us uh, on Twitter at proctorgroup. Um, as mentioned by Pam in the beginning if you'd like to request a product sample pack containing the materials discussed or book a meeting with one of our staff um, you can now do that on our webinar page www.proctorgroup.com forward slash webinar and personalised CPD certification is also available at the same link. Just a quick date for the diary before we go into the Q&A session. Um, our next webinar is actually a, a round table panel session um, on the benefits of retrofitting. Now that takes place on Friday the 9th of December at 10am, so our usual time. Um, the discussion will be 
As I said, around the benefits of retrofitting, covering issues such as the retrofit spectrum, how to achieve realistic balance of fabric technology and performance, and you know, interesting topics such as can the industry scale to deliver best practice design, amongst some other things. So the panel, very quickly, uh, we have Stephen Hodgson, who's the CEO of the Property Care Association, Jeff Colley, who's the editor of Passive House Plus magazine, uh, Christina Geiger, who is from the Edinburgh Architectural Association and very well known, John Stinson, who is the director at Building Research Solutions Limited, and last but not least, our technical director, Ian Fernington. Um, so just final bits here. If you've registered, you receive a follow-up email um, with all these links and a link to the replay. Um, and it would really help us if you give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed today's webinar, or you can subscribe to our channel to make sure that you're fully informed of what's coming next. So <clears throat> finally, onto the panel for this week, guys. Um, I'll start with the Proctor staff. So we have our senior ten senior technical advisor, Pamela Howitt. Morning, Pam. Morning, everyone. Uh, our business development manager, Adam Salt. Morning, Adam. Morning, Kira. Morning, everyone. Um, Stephen Booth, who is the senior facade manager at Cure Construction. Morning, Stephen. Good morning, everyone. Um, and lastly, Jason Fitzsimmons, who's the associate mechanical engineer with Gale and Snowden Architects. Hi, Jason. Good morning, go. Um, I'd just like to speak a little bit more about um, Galen Snowden's role uh, within this project, if you don't mind quickly. Um, they were the Passive House designers um, for St Sidwell's Point, the envelope architects, so they designed all aspects of the Passive House envelope, climate change adaptation design is also something they undertook, and lastly, the building they were the building biology consultants. Um, so they've been working with, from what I understand uh, from Jason, they've been working with Exeter City Council for over 20 years, um, and they actually introduced them to the Passive House standard around 15 years ago, um, when they designed the UK's first multi-residential Passive House scheme, uh, Knight's Place, and they've been educating um, Extra City Council in all things Passive House ever since. Um, and so since then, they've designed many Passive House certified schemes, really culminating in what we've learned about today since Sidwell's point. Um, so really interesting practice. Uh, and Thank you for that. You're, you're welcome, no problems. Um, so I'm going to jump straight into the questions because I've got they're coming through thick and fast on email and on the YouTube feed. If I miss any, we will come back to you by email, um, but we do try and capture them all. So, Adam, if I can come to you first, please. Um, a question from YouTube. James has asked, what involvement did Proctor have with St Sidwell's Point other than supplying the membrane? Um, OK, yeah, uh, good question. Uh, I think we were involved uh, quite heavily. Um, as you'll probably remember during the lockdown period, uh, Kira. Um, it all started off really with a CPD to Gail and Snowden um, Architects, where we kind of pitched the idea of looking at your airtight line externally using using Raptite. Um, once that kind of idea had been thrown out there, we then looked at the install potential uh, detailing uh, with the architects uh, and then progressed on to technical doing the calculations, the hydrothermal assessment methods mentioned in the presentation today. Um, once that was sort of all confirmed, you know, it was then looking at the testing, uh, a lot of the tests we had already, uh, in place, such as adhesion test on certain substrates, uh, fire tests that might be applicable as well. Um, but then it, it looked at, uh, with Kia massive cladding, putting together sort of a mock-up box, um, of the facade in a smaller, uh, area. And that's where we first got to sort of demonstrate wrap tight and try and, uh, see any potential problems and ways we can overcome them. Um, so a lot of work went into those uh, mock-up tests. Um, I remember going down early in that January with Stephen um, and Matthew Cladding. Uh, yeah, and then after that, it progressed on site and it was just constantly coming back to site, looking at the install, picking up on any areas, um, you know, that, that needed addressing or, um, or, you know, praising as well. Um, and just giving that full technical support from then on, uh, really, uh, wherever required. But it's important to point out as well, we don't just do this for a project like St. Sidwell's Point, we offer this to, to all of our projects as well. Uh, right. And it's kind of a standard practice at Proctor's, um, but yeah. Good, thank you very much, Adam. Um, Jason, Daniel has asked, why is air tightness especially important in leisure design? Um, well, it's important in most buildings, but especially so in a leisure facility, um, especially when you think about the, the pool halls themselves that are operating at really elevated temperatures compared to other buildings that uh, are operating at between 29 to 31 degrees all year round. 
So they've got um, significant heat load and they generally need heating all year round. So the firstly is the heating savings from cold air penetrating into the pool halls. Secondly, it protects the fabric better because you've got the risk of warm, moist air actually entering into the fabric and then you've got associated condensation issues with that. Thirdly, it can um, reduce the risk of thermal bypass where cold air can penetrate through the actual insulation uh, layer and actually reduce its performance. And then fourthly, from a point of view of uh, comfort, it just re re removes the risk of cold drafts actually in the pool hall environment. So it's just something that you don't really want, especially when people are in uh, the swimming costumes. So <laughs> that's, that's, that's the main reasons. Absolutely. Now you mentioned some of the um, energy savings, et cetera there. Um, Stephen, who's one of our regular webinar attenders, has asked, "Did you have you you know have you saved all the the data and all the operating data from the project?" Sorry, well, what do you mean, save the opera? Is that a question to me? I'm yes, sorry, <laughs> sorry, um, I, I'm not sure um, what you mean by that. The Stephen, operating. If you can come back, Stephen, and come back and clarify that question. Um, Does, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, assuming is meaning the operation the the energy in operational use. That's what I was thinking in terms of the energy savings, perhaps, but... Uh... Well, it's only been up and running since, um, is it April, Steve, May? <laughs> so it's only been up and running since this year. So there's still, it's still, settled, it's in its settling in period and it's a fine tuning period. So there will be some monitoring to review how the energy performance is actually um, working in use. So. That date is still to come out yet, so there will be a um, a period of review of reviewing that because we're all keen as designers and as builders um, of of the leisure centre to understand how it's actually performing in and how it's uh, meeting its design targets. So that will be forthcoming at some point in the near future. Good, good to hear. Fantastic. Um, and I have one by email here from Imogen. If I can stick with you, Jason, for now, please. What were the key principles behind the thermal zones in the building? Um, as you touched up upon in the presentation, you've got the we placed the the hot zones to the south to harvest solar gain. So you've got the the pool zones with um, the the glazed facades, so they can maximise the solar gain and um, reduce the the heating load in those zones. And as I was saying earlier, they need generally heating all year round, even during some uh, some of the summer period. Um, so that was the, um, the the main one of the key things. And then uh, we place the, the cooler zones on the north facade, so um, to reduce um, any, any solar gain in those spaces, such as the fitness suites that generally have to maintain temperatures at 18 degrees. Anything in between that is the, 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 the change in zones. We, cast, we uh, aim to cascade the thermal zone. So you go from the uh, swimming pool environment at 30 degrees to the changing rooms at 25 to 26 degrees, to then to the circulation space at 21, and then you get to the, the cooler zones at 18 degrees. And then, um, so the layout was important for optimization to reduce energy, because you don't want cool zones on the south facade because they're getting a lot of solar gain. So that was uh, a key principle. So that is the key, one of the key um, early stage optimization parameters to get maximized free savings. And then the zones themselves are all thermally separated. So opt, um, high performance glazing and door systems, the walls are all insulated. So they're all operating within their own, uh, within their own zone. And then they're all individually served um, from uh, individual ventilation systems. Thank you very much. Um, Steve, a question from Claire. Um, how did you manage engagement with the various teams on site with regards to the upskilling, inductions, et cetera? Yeah, good question. Um, so the, 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 the quantum of the challenge was, was, um, was realized obviously from the outset. So it was very important to develop a really robust um, culture on site, a positive culture on site. And we invested heavily uh, in all those processes very much from the outset. Um, we the understanding on site uh, was to develop a, a, a very much project and trade specific approach. Um, so, as you mentioned in, in the, the video earlier on, as soon as people walked onto site, there was something different about the whole approach. So it was very visual, very, very engaging. 
Uh, and through those various stages, we, we developed, along with yourself, some, some uh, trade and, and product specific training um, and, and utilizing the site mockups as well as a, a, a significant training tool um, to, to help assist with that process. Thank you very much, Stephen. Can I, can I just add it? It was very good to see on this project the engagement of and communication with every party as well from suppliers, subcontractors, main contractors, regulatory bodies, architects, um, and that certainly uh, helps with a lot of projects. Thank you. Uh, Pam, a technical one here. Um, Betty's asked, stick pins were mentioned in the webinar, how could they have been used without damaging the airtight layer? Yeah, I mean, it was something that uh, I came into a little bit later on because obviously due to lockdown and furlough, um, it came a little bit later into the, the project, um, but we basically hadn't really done much with stick pins. We didn't understand their use and their benefits, but uh, we researched and it spoke to a number of people and there are different types out there. So what actually happened was that we engaged with a company, got lots of samples of options, and then created a full scale, um, like a large scale rig um, here at our premises in Bergowrie applied wrap tight and this allowed us to simulate what it would be like to apply um, either self-adhesive stick pin or an adhesive bonded one to make sure that there was no sort of detrimental reaction or whether one bonded um, more securely than the other. And that allowed us to, um, to look at what might happen, which gave us the confidence to, to make recommendations um, for the actual site application. So because they're not actually puncturing the membrane, it's just holding the insulation and the um, wind tight membrane over the top of that. It, it really meant that there wasn't any um, puncturing and additional fixings going into the um, into the wrap tight. And also because they're very slim, they are literally very um, like very narrow skewers. And, and that meant that there was minimal impact on the um, the, the insulation going over the top as well but obviously that was was looked at and, and made sure it wasn't too significant an impact on the overall fabric. Good well I have another question which has come through via email um, from Douglas. Mm -hmm. um, how do the helping hand brackets fixing mm -hmm. penetrating the airtight layer affect the airtightness value um, and do the hundreds of mechanical fixings not pose a risk to the airtightness value? It's a great question. It's one we get quite a lot, you know, about the helping hand, etc. So um, any fixing through anything could impact on it. But with wrap tight, um, due to its unique composition of the fibrous layers and the adhesive in the back, there is a degree of sealing around fixings. You're also locking those helping hand brackets back onto the wrap tight, so it's, there's um, less chance of air gaps appearing. Um, and we're quite confident that it has minimal impact simply because we did large scale um, CWCT type uh, testing where we had a six metre by four metre rig set up with um, window penetrations, expansion joints um, and different types of helping hand brackets fixed onto that sheathing. That was then tested for infiltration and exfiltration to the CWCT standard. And the performance of that, there's, there's like a graph where you've got the sort of minimum performance. So at low level air pressure is quite sort of low and then it gets quite high at the top. We remained low and well, well below that level all the way through. So that exhibited an extremely high um, degree of air tightness with just normal fixings. The biggest risk comes from poor detailing or not picking up on maybe a bracket that's not been put in the right place has been removed and you've not remediated it but I know the guys on site were right on top of keeping track of every single extraneous penetration so as long as you're not putting extra ones in um, and, and removing them then really the, the impact on the air tightness is minimal and it's also more robust than external so once the facade's on once that insulation is on there are no more fixings going through that membrane um, unlike what could happen internally if somebody sort of decided to whack a nail into the wall at some point in the future. Okay. Sorry, Kira, can I just add a few mm. points to that? And thank you, um, Pamela. So there's really good points there in terms of the vulnerability of some of the fixes. So that was one of the, the key learning points for us was really challenge fixing methodologies for the various 
uh, for SAR components. So you're quite right, you've got two different types of fixing there. The helping hands fall in that category where you're fixing back to structure, so almost they're self-sealing uh, as, as you're talking them up. And then you've got the, the more vulnerable type fixings with regards to air tightness where, uh, take for example, an insulation fixing, which is is more reliant on the, the security of the sheath and board material behind. That's, that's the things there that you, you really need to consider. Pro, you know, a great example there with, with the development of an alternative method for the fire shield material, working closely with you guys, what a result. And that, it, the scale of that, it was huge. You know, so that's potentially, it, where it was in excess of over 10,000 less fixings penetrating your airtightness line. Mm. Each one of those could have been a potential leakage pass. Um, another point you made, which I'd just like to just sort of emphasize a little bit is, is the remedial work. So it's inevitable. The guys in, in, and um, individuals on site are out there in all weathers and all different types of access. It, it's inevitable that there's going to be um, mistakes are going to happen or, or issues that, you know, will happen. Mistral fixings is a great example of that. If you're giving the guys the tools, you know, to understand what the approach is to remediate those, i.e. an approved patch, you know, it, they know before getting to that issue what, what what the resolution is, what the plan B is, and we found that really important. So we we were very much about going back to the culture in that previous question, setting people up to succeed, giving them the tools to deliver the best possible job they could they can do on site. Can can I add something to that as well? Please, because it is a big thing, isn't it? And uh, it was credit to everybody involved who actually tested um, the, the fixings going into the airtight barrier. It wasn't something that was thought about lightly. Um, as designers, we didn't think about it lightly either because you've got an airtight line and there's lots of fixings in it, which is not an ideal scenario. And then Keir came on board and they didn't think about it lightly either. And it was all tested thoroughly beforehand with the mock-ups that Keir did and they did a remarkable job doing all that and testing it thoroughly before to ensure they were confident with it. You've got fixings uh, like the helping hand brackets that are screwed into the airtight line and then you've got the, the screws that are going into through the insulation and the insulation itself is quite thick. It's 250 mil. so you've got like guys on site that have got to screw through that insulation and, and be confident that it is um, uh, self-sealing especially when you like can't actually see it because you're going through insulation. So it's, it's credit to the, um, the team on site for actually doing the testing and, 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 and gaining the confidence to actually ensure that they, the air tightness wouldn't be compromised with that strategy. So coming back to it, it wasn't, um, it was thought about thoroughly beforehand and, and the, the, the final test result is the, uh, the proof that it did work. So it's great from that point of view. Well, one of the, the a secondary question from um, the architect that posed that one was actually at what points were the air, air tightness tests carried out? How many were done? Um, and I think we've answered how many, you know, how the problem areas were addressed. Um, and does it affect the sequencing, sequencing of the external wall build? I'll, I'll pick the, the initial part of that up. Um, it, this is this is the UK's first, world's first, isn't it? So it, it, this is the, the realization of stepping from a more traditional passive house building into a, a passive commercial type building, where you know you're upscaling significantly. So the, the approach is different. And in reality, in commercial building, no sooner is a, an internal area remotely weather tight, the internal trades commence their work. So that was one of the key drivers of, of pushing the air tightness line outbound of the structure. The, the external face of the sheath and board, just to to you know potentially assist with those um, overlaps. Um, the, the other thing as well is is um, the mixed media of back and wall construction. Again, picked up in the earlier presentation. You've got the COT, you've got block work, you've got RC, you've got steel frame, you've got SFS. So you, you know everything in, in in one sort of building. Uh, so it's the it's the interface and managing of those key interfaces which is the key challenge. So just getting back to the actual the question in hand, the air tightness strategy testing strategy was very organic as part of that. So we were very much learning, like everyone on on the project and developing as we go. Where we did get the confidence uh, from from the various uh, levels of install was through support through the manufacturers and system suppliers, and. And we needed to get to a point where we 
we were, had the confidence that we're installing systems and products in accordance with the manufacturer's recommendations and guidance. With that, we know that these gone through a, a really robust, and pa Pamela touched on earlier, CWCT type testing where the dynamic testing is you're firing a jet engine at it. You know, it goes through all these processes, which is a really robust and rigorous. So we had to replicate that on scale on site. The mock-ups played a very useful part of that. So like Jason touched on, we were able to, 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 to maybe come across a, a challenge or a, or, a, or a query, take it back into our sample room, build a box uh, and, and try and you know, demonstrate whether it was, it was good, bad or indifferent and whether we could do anything to improve. Um, so we ended up doing a lot of, an awful lot of um, small scale testing in our sample room on site. And then taking that onto the, the the live project itself, we then developed an interim testing strategy. The the challenges with the interim testing strategy, strategy and there's, there's lots of challenges, is if you isolate a room, in reality, you're only, only testing maybe 30, 40% of the actual true performing part of that. So you're reliant heavily on the quality of any temporary ceiling. Um, the complex geometry and nature of, uh, of St. Sibos Point has got a big open atrium. There is no ability to do any formal sectional testing. Mm. So you are, you, you couldn't leave it right to the end because you know, you, there's far, far too much of a risk. So we were developing, understanding, finding, you know, things that we thought would need further interrogation and then doing more mock-ups and testing. So yeah, very, very um, organic, but very beneficial because we were able to get right into the nuts and bolts of all the individual systems and products. Fantastic. Now, just coming on to the energy targets, um, Jason, how were the, Ben has asked, how were the passive, passive house energy targets set given the passive house classic standard is for simpler buildings, simpler buildings such as houses? Um, yeah, the, the, the passive house classic standard, uh, for those who do, don't know, um, sets energy targets for heating at 15 kilowatt hours per meter squared per annum. And then there's um, a primary electrical, primary, well, it's primary energy renewable target at 60 kilowatt hours per meter squared. And that's to do with the, um, the primary energy use of the building, including, including electrical energy. Now, a, uh, a leisure facility is a different um, more complex kind of building compared to a standard domestic building or a simple office building where that 15 kilowatt hours per meter squared would be applicable with the higher temperature zones um, in the pool halls and the, the fact that the large cavernous spaces as well the 15 kilowatt hours wouldn't apply because it applies generally to uh, 21 degrees um, uh, space temperature so uh, bespoke criteria had to be set, which was unique to St. Sidwell's Point. So for the uh, pool halls, it was set. It was um, it was it would it would have been modelled by the Passive House Institute using the Passive House Planning Package tool, mm -hmm. and it was set at forty kilowatt hours per meter square per annum. The rest of the spaces were set at twenty um, because you got the changing rooms at an elevated temperature as well. So that resulted in a total heating target of sixty kilowatt hours per meter square per annum. When, so when you compare that to classic standard, that's which is 15, it's, it's a lot higher. There was uh, bespoke criteria also set for the, the cooling zones because um, they um, require cooling, more not not uh, the, the heating target. So bespoke criteria was set for that. And then the other unique element is all the electrical equipment in a leisure centre, such as the fitness suite and in particular the pool filtration, which can, is quite significant in a leisure centre. Up to a third of the total electrical energy is uh, generally associated with uh, pool filtration systems. So all that was um, assessed and modelled and bespoke criteria was set unique to the leisure centre. And that's how these complex buildings would be set up for other projects as well. They would have bespoke targets set. Okay, very interesting. Thank you. And very complex, um, learning a lot today. Um, Adam, George has asked, do proctors have other airtight options in their range? Uh, yes, we've got a wide range and it, it really depends on your, your project. 
um, taking Ian Bennington's statement there. Um, and what your requirements are. So we've got fire rated uh, B and A class uh, vapor control layers. We've got um, Protec Adapt, which can adapt to humidity for better drying out during the summer periods. Um, but then we've also got the, the wrap type, which we've heavily talked about. I think when we look at air tightness, um, on paper, all these sort of membrane systems can achieve zero or as close to zero as possible. Um, but where the performances are, are sort of won and gained is when it's installed on site um, and all the, the potential penetrations that it's going to uh, have, um, as we discussed quite in depth today. Um, so that's where Raptide really benefits. You know, it's fully bonded, it's externally. Um, and and uh, it, I think Pam's analogy she's used before, um, when you're wrapping loads of little Christmas presents, it's easier to put it in a box um, and wrap the box. Um, and that, that's quite similar when looking at the internal versus external uh, air tight lines, uh, which is why a lot of people look at wrap tight. Um, also, just going back to the stick bins, want to give two special sort of shout outs there. Um, when we were tasked, you know, can we install fire shield without any more penetrations to the airtight line or wrap tight? Uh, and then going through 250 mil rock wall, I didn't think there was a solution. Uh, but Ian Fennington, our technical director, sort of came up with the idea of stick pins and then fix fast as well. Warwick, uh, especially, uh, looked at it and did, did some of their own in house uh, testing. Um, and that's where the idea developed um, for that solution, really. Well done, Ian. I've already done Ian's appraisal, so I can't normally. No, you're <laughs> right. And I think Ian had been involved, Pam, correct me if I'm wrong, many years ago in a project at uh, in Edinburgh. It was at the, yeah. I think it was the the, the, the Parliament building was, yeah. where we, we, he'd come up with that as a historic solution. So there's a... It goes to show that sometimes old historic solutions are still applicable today, but it's mm-hmm. merging new technology with old technology and making sure it's compatible. Absolutely. And just leading on from what Adam was saying there about Raptite being used externally, Paul has asked Pam, if I come to you for this one, was Raptite really suitable for all areas of the build? Um, he's curious about the compatibility with the block work. Yeah, yeah. I think we had conversations and we see various uh, engagements back and forward looking at the quality of the build because that was a, a sort of a change um, to the original specification in that area. But things like block work certainly come with their own challenges. But it's, it's like everything, they all, all areas need to be prepared properly, first of all, so that there's no rough bits that are going to snag, that there's no um, wet areas or coatings or latencies or contaminants that might affect that bond. So block work in that respect was no different, but obviously it's a rougher surface. Um, you've got mortar joints, you've got mortar snots that need to be ground off, levelled. Um, you've got potentially a block that could be anything from quite a smooth finish, depending on the make, to, you know, very sort of rough 100 Newton, you know, standard engineering type block work wall, which, you know, doesn't actually give a lot of surface for the membrane to bond on. So again, it depends about those interfaces. How does that section of block work link on to others, making sure you get the overlaps? Um, so, you know, there was a lot done looking at it in great detail to make sure it was ready to take their appetite um, and, and then there's other things that you can do to enhance that that bond um, if, if needed um, so things like using um, primers like an acrylic primer it's I know it's one of the key points you don't generally need to use it with appetite but sometimes especially in these types of pacifies projects especially when you're looking to get you know 0.4 air changes or, or better that actually, you know, looking at using some of these products to enhance the bond, it's not a bad thing. It's all about making sure that your build is as robust and will provide you what you need. Um, so, you know, yeah, it's it's a challenge, but the guys definitely overcame on site. I, I remember that uh, very well. I think Stephen and I were, were very nervous on that block work, but then we saw the, the results and the performances. It, it did very well on there, didn't it? Yeah. So yeah. Fantastic. Um, Stephen Stewart has asked, are you continuing to use the Passive House Passport to develop for St Sidwell's on other sites? Yes, yeah, that's very much being promoted on, on, on other schemes. And I, and I think really, it didn't really do the culture side justice at the, the start of the, um, the Q&A session. The, the real purpose of building this positive culture, it's a no blame culture, like it said in the presentation, but, I don't know about it. 
everybody likes a bit of recognition. So you're building to a point where you, you, you've, you've gone through a, a, a fairly uh, rigorous bit of on-site, site-specific, project-specific, uh, you know, product-specific training. Uh, and the engagement we got back from that was was fantastic. Because we were we we tailored these inductions um, to the various trades. You, you're not you know expecting a ground worker to sit through a you know a facade a cladder related induction. So you get a little bit more engagement with that because it's it's relative. It's in, engaging for the individuals. They know they know they know what they're talking about. So with that, when we got a, a lot more engagement, a lot more buy in. Um, and and the passports really just said, look, here we go. This is great. You've gone through this process. Here's that bit of recognition. You've you've, you've worked hard. You've you know you've you've gone through all the stages. The amount of pride we had from the individuals on 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 site was was fantastic, and they were sharing via social media or whatever. You taking photographs of in, in, installing insulation with a uh, no more than a three mil gap between. Um, being really proud of this stuff and taking that on to their next project so it's just that it's the little things that count isn't it and that's how we can spread spread the sort of knowledge and, and lessons learned throughout all these various stages going back simple answer yes we are we're very much promoting the passive house passports um, but this is a stepping stone we were the first now we can build on this We've got a fantastic opportunity now to to work with all the supply chain and manufacturers to develop uh, and build on on the the scheme really fantastic good to hear um adam a bit of an odd one here but i'm going to come to to you for this one and i'm sure others would, would be able to input as well um i've always assumed passive house projects would be boring and box shaped and um, but that isn't the case with st sidwell's point um yeah, anything to add? Maybe we'll ask jason for his input on the, on that after you yeah, I think that, that's a good point. And I shared the same view uh, prior to working on this project. Um, and I think it's because having a, a box makes the detailing a lot simpler to achieve those those very difficult performances. But a, a project like this really promotes that it doesn't have to be like that. Um, I remember very well driving down that, that main road towards the roundabout uh, as the project progressed and just seeing all these great shapes and uh, all develop. I also think size is quite important as well. I always thought that passive house projects would be quite small, uh, especially sort of self-build house projects. Um, and St. Sidor's point is huge. I mean, the, the photos don't do it justice because it's on loads of different levels and, and built back into the, the ground. Um, but it is a massive project and still to achieve those air tightness performances on that is phenomenal. Um, but it does show it can be done. And uh, yeah, it's uh, we're seeing a lot more of it now as well. Passive house high-rise projects are popping up um and uh yeah it's just just growing and growing and jason you must have seen that landscape change a lot in your you know your time in the passive house sector if you just quit unmute sorry uh yeah um it is a very very interesting uh since it was point from that point of view and um yeah you do have obviously people think that passive house is just you know all about compactness and form factor and, and creating these box-like buildings. And you do get energy efficiency from that approach. Um, but coming back to the um, how the project was set up in the first instance, where we were, what we what we did was um, we created like some three D thermal models to test the design and various concepts, and to maximise uh, free savings. And free savings, such as we were talking about earlier, the thermal zoning and getting the glazing ratios right and getting the... And so we, as part of that thermal modelling exercise, we were, we were testing um, orientation, glazing ratios, thermal zones, different insulation strategies. So um, that allowed us, created a bit more flexibility in the design. The other interesting thing about, I mean, there's so many different interesting things on this project. We worked with another architect practice and we'd, we'd come from, as you uh, introduced us, from um, working with Exeter City Council, developing uh, quite a few passive house schemes. Um, uh, the first schemes were social housing schemes, apartment buildings, that kind of thing. And then all of a sudden we started, we, we, we moved into St. Sidwell's Point and someone has used the term, um, 
passive house on steroids and since it was point was most certainly that it had um two architects working on a project so we had s p architects who were the primary leisure center designers and then ourselves so there was different ideas muted so obviously our you know different designers got different approaches so we went with the flow of what s p were introducing the ground itself had some challenges it was also it was stepped the site was within a particular site in the city so we're trying to maximize orientation around other buildings so you've got all those um, competing complex factors and then, it, it, as I say, it's it, it's a leap up from standard, you know, passive aux classic into mega complex leisure facility with all these competing thermal zones, and and um, yeah, it, it's not a box for certain, and it had its complexities. And it had its air tightness complexities, and we had those penetrations that we've all talked about, and we've been going over with questions and answers, and. What it did show at the end is that you ha- you can do certain things with passive house. It doesn't have to be a box, and um, we pushed the, the boundary was pushed, and and that's the, and that was the end result. But it's um, just understanding the design at the outset is key. Knowing where you're going, and um, and then putting that together, and and yeah, sensible's point was obviously the end result. It doesn't have to necessarily be a box design but <laughs> you've got you've got to understand where you're going with it and what the what the complexities are and also maximize as many free savings as you can to then push the boundaries with the design good and i think one of the fantastic things about this project having won so many awards now is that it's starting there's, there's a buzz for me around it and a lot more people are starting to learn and understand that these boundaries can be pushed and different things can be achieved so I think the more that people are talking about it the better because as you say you know it's misunderstood at times um, what can be done with passive house yeah with, uh, within reason <laughs> <laughs> uh, um goodness Pam I have a, a product one here profile so why was profile used in the pool areas is it not affected by the chemicals used in pool environments being a foil yeah, so Steve dropped um, probably confirmed this. So it was used as part of the standing seam roof system that was installed in it, and there were some isolated areas um, at high levels where it was used as well. And yeah, by its name, you think profile's got a foil in it. Um, foils are tend to used tend to be used for high humidity situations because they're a lot more impermeable compared to to other products. Um, and, and yes, if it was an exposed foil, it, it, it would be problematic. But the way the profile is manufactured is it's encapsulated with polythene on both sides. There's no exposed um, um, foil, which certainly if you were in a normal swimming pool environment, there would be a lot of chlorine and chemicals which could attack it. But we also know from the presentation that, you know, the chlorine in the swimming pool is in Sidwells is, is no less or no more than you know, what's in normal tap water. So, you know, already by the way they've looked at the biology of that building, the impact on the membrane is, is less critical, but other um, situations may have more um, corrosive um, chemicals in the air, and that could be things like um, laundry or industrial processes. So by protecting that that foil, it does mean that it's it, it does afford a, a lot of protection to the overall membrane. Um, similar principles to um, our gas membranes as well. You know, it's a similar composition to our Protect um, methane and carbon dioxide membrane. Stephen, did another, you have something to add there? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to mention there another part of the QA process and the mm-hmm. quality control process on site. So we, we, we need to install these products in accordance with the, the manufacturer's and tested, you know, uh, recommendations. So making sure your overlaps are, are, are correct, you, you, you're sealing the laps as suggested. Like Pamela um, said, this is high, humidity classification class five it is, so the highest very much. So, so there's there's certain little quirks and quirks you need to do in addition to a more traditional VCL. Penetrations, again, we talked a lot about penetrations and type, but you know, this is specific detail and this is not uh, you know, just coming up with the solution as you're coming across the the penetration this is it needs to be thought earlier on so with that there was a huge amount of focus on scheduling out every individual penetration through the building 
as as we worked up through the, the various packages and we were in a position then to uniquely reference and a uniquely detail you know there's not infinite different types of detail but there was a suite of of specific details to deal with each of these penetrations again then when the guys got to so the individuals got to the to the work face they had a solution they knew what they were doing you know setting them up to succeed again they had the tools for the job so really really important um you install it as required you know that it's going to perform you've got that added, added layer of comfort which is is what you need when you're you're delivering and, and designing the delivering super high performance buildings good um jason Callum's asked what other energy or environmental criteria did the scheme have to meet as well as passive house um yeah so on top of the the passive house there were other factors other environmental and energy factor well environmental criteria i'd say that the client set in the brief um one of the key ones was um designing the building to be climate change resilient until 2080 and this was um using weather files from ex university's prometheus project where they um set uh, they created a load of weather files um uh, looking at future climate change scenarios depending on um different carbon emission scenarios that society was heading into, whether it's medium or high. So um, this Prometheus project from Exeter University um, allowed designers to choose from a suite of, of, of weather files, depending on the risk to the building. So um, the, um, the weather files that was chosen for um, this project were the um, based on medium carbon emission scenarios up to 2080. So that was um, a fair temperature increase because it was to do with um, the uh, modeling the building to assess against um, rising temperatures and comfort factors and and um, and how that would affect also um, energy moving into the future so the the design had to be uh, climate change resilient to 2080 from a comfort point of view and an overheating point of view and also there's other criteria as part of that climate change resilience which um was more difficult to quantify because a thermal model you can just look at the results of temperature and comfort and you've got your, your your energy coming out of it as you're modeling into the future but the other criteria is, um, was uh, looking at driving rain how that's going to change in the future and um, increased wind speed um, and, and changing wind patterns on the building uh, and water shortages and that kind of thing um, so the uh, the that criteria of, of uh, in, increased wind speed was also led to the the use of the fire shield because the um, the, the climate change resilience there of using that fire shield was to um, reduce the impact of what you were saying in your video wind washing and thermal bypass. Um, so that was um, that's all part of the climate change criteria. There was also um, some building biology criteria to to design to build in biology principles. So that was concerning things such as um, optimized air quality, good water quality. So that's where the, um, the microfiltration came in and the reduced chlorine and uh, what we were talking about a minute ago. And, um, and that in itself is um, re re um, reduces um, water as well using the microfiltration. So there's, um, I think it's up to 50% water savings with that, that kind of filtration system compared to others. And then there's other things within the building biology criteria to do with optimal daylight levels. So as part of the thermal med modeling exercise going into 2080 weather files, just touching on that, it was 2030, 2050, 2080 um, so scenarios that we looked at. But as part of that, we also did daylight modeling because one of the things that the passive house standard doesn't actually, it's, it's an energy standard and it's fantastic on, on many fronts and comfort is, is an energy are, are the key things within it and um, fab fabric protection and condensation, that kind of thing. But the, the, there are other things that you need to assess as part of the design. And one of them is daylight. So you want to be um, ensuring that you've got optimal daylight levels with your glazing strategies. So if you're modeling for, um, overheating in pool hall environments or you're optimizing for passive house and you um and uh, and you're putting um zones onto the north and you might have reduced glazing on the north because you want to reduce heat loss and all that you still want to ma maximize and optimize the uh, daylight levels that was part of the criteria so if you'll notice on sensitive point we've got a stepped roof 
So because they're deep spaces, so we want to get the daylight to penetrate deep into the space. So the step roof allows glazing uh, um, uh, further into the space on the roof. So we could, that's part of that um, strategy to meet the uh, client's um, daylight requirements as well. And the other th big thing with uh, the building biology was the reduced uh, use of um, materials that contain chemicals. So if, you, um, if you've been sensitive to this point, you might notice there's a lot of natural materials within the, within the spaces, um, natural timbers and natural paints. So it's all to do with um, not using materials that contain VOCs and chemicals. So they, that, 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 that was some of the other key things that were, um, were set as part of the environmental criteria from the client, but they all kind of merged together passive house um, climate change resilience and the building biology because passive house is also concerned with ventilation and air quality as well so they um they all came together but that added as you can appreciate the whole complexity of the <laughs> complex leisure center as we would as it was being designed thank you jason um stuart has asked if i can just go on to this on youtube I'm become to Adam for this. Can Proctor issue generic guidance on self seal fixings through airtight membranes based on the experience from St Sidwell Point to uh, you know what to prioritise and what to avoid? Um, uh, Pam might be able to help out on this one actually. <laughs> Pam? Um, yeah, in terms of fixings, I mean, uh, with a lot more of our projects, uh, we take a lot of helping hand brackets, a lot of penetrations through them, and wrap tight. As long as there's no massive holes uh, with its self-sealing nature, uh, deals with those quite well. Um, I don't know too much about self-sealing fixings. Do you, Pam? No, I mean you get things like um, fixings with washers and you know, or sort of gaskets integrated with them. So they do also help to to seal over as well. So that's the sort of thing. Um, I mean, certainly we've got quite a comprehensive um, installation guide. Um, there's a generic one, there's one more sort of in troubleshooting, and it's something that we can look at, you know, maybe adding a section when we come to, to doing a marketing review of that, you know, sort of maybe go a little bit more into the fixing side of things, because it is being asked. Um, we don't have anything yet, but I mean, certainly the principles of, of all of these projects um, could be, you know, formulated into some sort of guidance for people, of sort of watch areas, and I think more on the quality assurance side for site managers um, for what they need to, to watch for. So uh, we don't have anything yet, but it's certainly something that we can look at okay. incorporating. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, can I just pick up on just something on, on the, the fixing term again? Again, it's just challenging the, the fixing methodology, really interrogating them. So take a, a, um, a, an insulation fixing for example, you've got a fixing site where you can uh, pre-drill a hole, you know, pilot pre-drill pre a hole and then introduce a fixing, or you've got a more self-drilling type fixing. So you've got le least or less risk to maybe drill in, oversize a hole and then introduce more of a risk there. So self-drilling type fixings, one hit, they're done. Um, the other the other thoughts, obviously, what you mentioned previously, is uh, uh, the the ones with incorporated gaskets and seals, and as long as they're talked up in accordance with the requirements, then they should be relatively self sealing. Um, but yeah, there's, it just needs to be really considered robustly from the outset. I think also when with looking at it externally, once you've detailed them and you. you cladding's on and your project's finished you've got your air tightness result that's less likely to change for the longevity of the projects uh, because you can't access the external air tight line when they're internal um, obviously they you know there could be future penetrations especially in apartments when homeowners move in because um, it can be accessible um, so that's another thing with detailing them externally uh, for the longevity of your projects agree um, how were the standing seam fixing clips in the roof secured to the substrate without penetrating the membrane? Uh, Stephen, would that be one you could answer, or Pam, perhaps? Well, certainly, no, it's probably impossible not to put penetrations through, but with things like standing seams and, and traditional VCLs like the profile, by using butyl tape, um, you know, underneath your fixing, again, they are sealing around it because it's that like mastic type scenario. Um, I don't know specifics about the, the roof application in this one, but 
I know that Euroclad are, are very experienced working with our membranes and do use the, the probon tape as part of the system to mitigate that. Again, again, it's just you know concentrating on the interfaces and the overlaps and the penetrations. The, the in the context of Saint Sibwells, it was a CLT roof roof and structure. It was an eighty mil thick. So, again, going back to a solid backing structure. As soon as those fixings are introduced and talked up as required, then they're almost self sealing. So it's more the the, the key to really robust QA hold points, making sure every overlap's checked, every penetration, you know, service penetration's checked, any damage is re repaired in accordance with the requirements. Um, and, and then you're building again those la layers of confidence and comfort. Good. Okay, coming to the last uh, last question or two now. Um, Stephen, Joe has asked, as main contractor, what was your biggest challenge on this project? That's a, a great question. <laughs> Where do I start? Um, I, th I think the upskilling side of it was a was a huge challenge, and that was um, for everybody on site. The, 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 everybody involved in the project, almost because of that step over from the more traditional passive house type building to the passive commercial type building. The scale was was the big was one of the big challenges. Uh, hence us really interrogating everything we possibly could using the samples using the knowledge and expertise and specialist consultants like you know again to, to really help um unearth a lot of the um lessons learned from previous schemes and, and then take those to another level really um i think it's understanding the challenges the big things so take again take saint sibwell's as, as a really good example of this you talk about an air permeability target figure. So take 0.4. What does that actually mean? You can't design to it. You know, you design when you, you're looking at passive house buildings, you're designing to zero because there is no contingency. But what does that figure mean to, to the individuals on site? I mean, it doesn't mean a lot. It doesn't mean that, you know, it, it's challenging. So we're trying to put that into some form of context. So let's take... Uh, the envelope area at St. Sibyl's Point is just it's just under 10,000 square metres. So what does that 0.4 target look like? It's an A3 bit of paper, and that puts it into a really good, clear bit of context so you can associate it with it. So you're looking at that during your training, your upskilling, every reference back to it. Um, so it's little things like that. It, it, the most important thing to do is... is simplify wherever you can standardize wherever you can and really just drive through education training and just building on all the good work that's been done in the past i think <laughs> sorry to to, to to go on but um, there's unfortunately there's no magic formula is there to to delivering super high performance buildings and the reality is you can uh, you know have the best design the the most robust buildable details and specify and install the highest performing products and systems. However, the reality is, you know, you are reliant on key individuals on, on the ground with the, the specialist knowledge, the drive and the dogged determination to make sure they, they leave no stone unturned. You know, we were, we were really fortunate at SSP. We, you know, we, we collaborated, we engaged early, and we had a really, really good core team there who just who understood it. It's more than an aspiration. This is this is you need to take it really seriously. And they need to be in a position where you can check, you can evidence a really big part of passive house standard. The evidence is very process driven, very evidence based. And and add in layers of comfort wherever you can. If you think it could do with an extra bit of tape, in the grand scheme of things, it's nothing. The consequences of not achieving that figure or the performance requirements are completely unparalleled. Aren't they? So it's really just engaging early uh, and, and, and just promote that best practice. Good. And Jason, uh, from an architectural point of view, if I just come to you for, for the last comment for today, 
Um, can you answer the same thing? I mean, what, what were your biggest challenges? What can be learned from this really? Yeah, there was um, coming back to passive house on steroids. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's um, yeah, it was a lot of it was challenging. Um, the, just the leap into a leisure center design, the fact that no one had done it before, that in itself was challenging. Um, the um, many design aspects, such as um, the schemes we'd done before, the details were simpler because they were like simpler buildings, just the, um, the connection to the ground, the connection to the curtain walling. Every aspect has to be designed and detailed in terms of air tightness and in terms of thermal bridging. We have to do calculations around those thermal bridges, those thermal bridges. And there were just some really complex junctions. To, well, when I say really complex, they're just more complex than the, the standard passive house schemes that we've done before. Um, you've got, um, for instance, the ground is, um, is heavily piled. So there's all big thermal bridges going into the ground that we had to um, optimize and take insulation down the piles and get 3D calculations done for that. So... <laughs> The, 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 the wall construction that we've just been talking about, every screw that was penetrating the building, all those, um, the, the, um, the brackets um, holding the cladding up, all that had to be calculated. We had to understand what the U value was. It wasn't just simply the U value of the insulation, 250 mil on the wall. We had to understand the, the thermal impact of all those bits of metal going through the insulation and calculate all that out. Um, and on other projects, we just had simpler um, wall construction. We had, I mean, you mentioned three wall constructions, for instance, in, in the video. Actually, there was four. There was a concrete um, wall, retaining wall in the basement. So, you know, you've got four different wall constructions. I think there was three different roof constructions just due to the nature of the building. And, yeah, you could say, well, why wasn't it done simpler? But it's a, it's a big, complex leisure centre. You, you try and simplify it as much as possible, but you, have, you, you are going to get different construction types to deal with and not only if you've got a um you got more more calculation and design considerations there's more interfaces with all that from a design point of view and then there's all the thermal zoning and all the plant and all the penetrations that steve was talking about all that has to be considered um yeah so um yeah it was so many things were challenging but the great thing was, and I think we've, it's been, uh, Steve was talking about it, was the attitude that people came on board with. Everybody got into it. Everybody got into the passive house mindset. And it was just great to see this collaboration of everyone from designers to client to contractors on site to the supply chain and, and subcontractors. Everybody really engaged in it and changed their attitude to um, to changes and introducing ideas. Even the, the MEP design um, installers, T. Clark, they came up with some unique ideas of around the plant systems because they were just looking at every little bit that you could do to save energy. And the 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 um, the quality of the install, the insulation quality around the piles, it was just beautiful. It was just perfectly cut and you just wouldn't ordinarily see that on a scheme. On other projects, I mean, okay, Passive House has grown and contractors are more used to it. But on some of our early projects, even though some of them were um, housing schemes, they were really challenging. They were really challenging because the contractors didn't get it, didn't really understand what they were doing and they didn't kind of get into the, the mindset of it. Um, so, um, but, but yeah, so... There were challenges, but there were things that helped it on its way and care coming on board and getting into the challenge of the passive house and the way the approach on site just made things a lot easier from our point of view. And that was our, our biggest worry is how the contractor would engage with it, given the complexity of it and the fact that it was a multi-complex um, passive house scheme. Um, I could just we could just go on all day talk about the challenges of the project because there, there were and uh, there were there were lots but we learned lots as well and we proved that you can you know put something together and get the the mindset of everybody to deliver 
uh, and uh, a, a passive house scheme on a complex um, building such as this. So um, I'm going to shut up now. So thank someone else can no, say something. No, thank you. It's, it's, it's such an interesting <laughs> project. And I think, you know, we as a business, we're absolutely thrilled to be involved, certainly with our products and a, a lot of learning for us along the way as well. Um, a few head scratching moments and as, uh, you know, the, the same concept applied to us in terms of the learning and support. Um, so, so and we were, we were really grateful for you, for you, for Proctor to be involved as well, because we did put lots of questions back to you. I remember doing it, especially on the condensation analysis. I went back and forth to you. I said, look, well, let's try this now. Let's try this. Let's try this. And you must have been getting pretty fed up of me doing that. Well, the, the people, but you kept responding and trying different wall types and different build-ups. And so that was great from that point of view. And then coming up with the stick pin solution, because that was a big concern for the, uh, for the fire shield, because um, we didn't want more penetrations. We didn't want more from an air tightness point of view, and we didn't want more from a thermal point of view. And because they were so thin, we could exclude them from the, the U-value count because they were just um, not deemed um, thermally significant compared to the, the, the metal screws holding the insulation up. So it was, you know, that was another example of, you know, supply chain engagement getting into the, the, whole, the whole thing because it's um, obviously there's a lot of work around that, but you you guys did great and you got involved in it at the right level. It was brilliant. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we really... It? I was just going to say, we really do enjoy problem solving at Proctors. Um, so we actually like when those challenges come towards us. Um, and uh, yeah, it was great to, to have those thrown at us. Um, and yeah, technical, we're very busy on this project. Um, poor Callan did a lot of woofy calculations. Um, actually, a bit of a joke. Sometimes I call him and say we need to do another one for St. Sidor's point. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, it's uh, it was great, great to work on it and, and learn from it. Yeah, yeah, was. Okay, well, I think that's us at the end of today's webinar. Can I just thank you so much? Um, well, Adam and Pam, obviously, and um, thank you for being part of the Proctor um, side of the panel. And Stephen and Jason, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here and sharing your knowledge and experience of this project and, and you know, the things you get involved in in general. So thank you. Um, it's a pleasure. So, Thanks. Thank you. Good. Uh, for everyone watching, please don't miss our next webinar, which is a roundtable panel discussion, um, which I think is going to be really interesting. Some differing views on the panel, um, so that could be interesting in itself. Um, but it is on Friday the 9th of December at 10 a.m. and it's all around the benefits of retrofitting. Um, so it could be talking about, you know, is it fit for purpose? What is the actual purpose of benefiting? Can we afford to put off retrofit? Um, so will economics beat the legislation to net zero? Um, can the industry actually scale to deliver best practice design? Um, and the, the panel's going to be there to take um, your questions. So um, the panel very quickly, Stephen Hodgson, uh, CEO of Property Care Association, Jeff Colley, who's the editor of Passive House Plus magazine, Christina Gaynor of Edinburgh Architectural Association, John Stinson, Director at Building Research Solutions Limited, um, and our Ian Fernington, all-round problem solver um, of St Sidwell's um stick pins and um, who's the technical director at the proctor group so it's going to be a really interesting webinar um so please give us a thumbs up if you've enjoyed today's webinar and subscribe to our channel you'll see we're, we're also um sharing a lot of other things you know videos installation um information etc so if you subscribe you'll automatically be made aware of those so um thanks again guys wishing everyone a lovely weekend and um, we hope to see you again soon thanks so thank you